what made you finally want to get to the point where you felt like you had to speak your truth? Yeah, do you know uh, how the video actually came about is, I suppose, an interesting story. For me, for years, a lot of the, the stuff I talked about in the video is something I don't talk about. You know, you, you're trying to get by, whether it's as a player or in work, you're, you're often the only in the room. I would say 99% of the room I, I walk into, I'm the only black person in my industry. So a lot of it was bottled up and I hadn't spoken about it. And what happened is I was on a Teams call with Sky, um, who I obviously broadcast for here in the UK. And um, they asked me if I wanted to speak about Black Lives Matter. Now I'd been going to rallies, George Floyd, um, on the, off the back of George Floyd. I was like being quite active and proactive at the protest. And so I was casual when they said, do you want to talk about it? And on a team call in front of all the staff, the commentators, directors, producers, I broke down. I mean, I really wept. Um, and I didn't realize that emotion was still there. I guess it was been bottled up for years that um, after we had the team call and like it took me a couple of hours just to kind of control myself, um, you know, the head of Sky called a uh, cricket, Brian Henderson called me and said, look, I think we should um, capture the emotion because what you said to us um, actually made us think about, you know, our own industry and racism and maybe stuff that we're not aware of. And, you know, I started speaking to Mikey on text and it kind of came off that. So, you know, what I realized is one, I didn't know how emotionally charged it was for me until I even actually broached the subject that I've been hiding. Um, but second of all, I suppose I didn't realize that it could actually impact people because people from, you know, our staff are, are um, you know, pretty much like a lot of our, our cricket world that, you know, they weren't necessarily the most diverse team, but they said the message connected with them. So once we realized that it, it could possibly connect with people, we decided to do it. So it's been incredible, the response. I mean, millions of views and um, it's something I'm now proud of, but I have to be honest, I was seriously nervous about the, uh, the response. Ebony, let me ask, what, speak of, of, of your experiences, which we all share. It's a lived experience for, for so many of us Black people, uh, minority ethnic, where as, as kids, you're almost it's conditioned to have to deal with, with some of this racism, which comes in, in the form of dog whistle language, which, which you addressed in, in, in that piece alongside Michael Holding. And now finding ourselves here as adults having deal with these things our entire lives and speaking about them speaking our own truth yet still it takes such an emotional toll on us why now and why do you feel it continues to impact us as adults something that mm -hmm. we've dealt with pr pretty much our entire life i think it feels like a huge secret which we all know we're in on this game and so how I'll describe that is, um, you know, if you go, for me, if I go into a work environment and you hear a slur or something inappropriate, um, they know it's most probably inappropriate, but also often the culture allows for that to happen. And you know, to stay in the game, you keep quiet. So I think there's this kind of unwritten secret that's felt like, uh, that's what I think kind of um, why BLM this summer is specifically after George Floyd because I think people were like we can no longer accept buying into this this system of knowing that inequalities exist knowing that racial disparities exist biases exist that are affecting you know specifically the black community in this but yet still the other side is knowing that to get by often we as black people will buy into that to survive keep your jobs keep your mm -hmm. livelihood and I think this year was one year where we just all said enough is enough. You know, that was the watching George Floyd just hit so much saying, look, enough is enough. Um, you know, we can't buy into this. We can't live kind of into this system where we are continually and we partly have to play the game to try and maintain our, our livelihoods. And it's just, mm. I think we got to that point. So I felt this summer, if, the, if there was ever going to be a time that I spoke up, I'd do it with, with the community and also it's important to note that that community isn't just the black community i think that's what's different about this movement actually is how diverse the protests were that a lot of people from different backgrounds realize that we've got to start just changing the system because it's not working for so many people 
And I think one of the things now that obviously we're, we're trying to do with this is, is to, as cliche as it may sound right now, is continue the conversation because that's the thing we've seen where it, it becomes sort of a flavor of the month. Everyone gets on board and then carries on with their regular life. And the point is that regular life for us, sadly, includes racism and having to come up against it. And, and that's what we're trying to change right now. So um, bringing it back, though, because we really want to understand the, the, the role of sports in this. And um, I know one of the things you said in that video, which um, kind of took me back a little bit, was the fact that, you know, you, you grew up in a diverse community, a racially diverse community, being from London, you know, it's just such a melting pot, much like the Caribbean, where obviously Shaq and I are from. I know you've got your Caribbean roots too, but you really said that um, as soon as you walked into the world of cricket, that's mm -hmm. when the comments started for you. And for me, I find it crazy because for us, Shaq and I, as much as Mikey Holding said in that video too, growing up in Jamaica, he didn't experience any racism until he left, just like myself, probably similar for Shaka. Um, but for us, cricket is, is a sport in the Caribbean that's um, not really viewed for the elite. You know, it, it's kind of of everyone. It, it's, it's, we grew up with the West Indies team being a team, you know, that was formed by the colonizers um, and, and the English being that. So when I came to England and I realized I was thinking that I would see much more diversity in cricket. Um, but that obviously ebbs wasn't the case or is not the case here, is it? It isn't. And I think you have to go back to the roots of cricket. Um... Cricket really is rooted in empire and the empire is responsible for a lot of these racial um, inequalities and problems that we have right now. And um, cricket in England is very different. You know, I've traveled around, I've been to the West Indies, the subcontinent. And like you say, it is, it's an open game. It's a much more accessible game, but here it still maintains the, the values of how the game was originally used. You know, cricket was used as a sport, um, to go to its areas where it's colonized and used as a tool. Um, so I guess, uh, I don't know what, what the word is, but almost um, share the values of the empire, you know, promote that. Um, civilize elitist, people sometimes. Civilize, all of that. And so that still to an extent is maintained here where that was the roots of the original game. You know, then you have a kind of a county structure and all that, you know, the private schools and that whole network has... And so over time, you can't flip that. You, you can't flip that without really looking and examining the sport. And so for me, I went from this, like you say, you know, I grew up in uh, Brixton, South London, which is a melting pot of everybody. And black, white, no one ever mentioned anything about colour or the food or whatever. And then you go into this world where um, it's not diverse. People aren't used to people of colour. And some of, the, some of the comments weren't necessarily racist. It was just complete unaware of people of different backgrounds you know do you wash your skin well of course I wash like hello you know comments about your hair your, your food everything was just constant and um you know that's partly because some of those communities and those people have come from a very white privileged background and that hasn't changed and it needs to change half of you know the, the things I'm really trying to promote in our game over here in the UK is to, to work with sports like cricket golf um tennis over here is the same where it isn't diverse um throughout and and to do that you have to really examine the roots of why it's structured like that to be able to make a difference um it's very possible but without movements like blm creating accountability and awareness i don't think the the powers that be are going to do enough so um you know it's, it's a real moment where i hope like you said this is not just a um you know, a few months of conversation following a, a massive global movement um, that's been building for some time. But actually, I hope that people really start to examine and become accountable for change. And I mean, uh, just one of the things too with, with cricket, just to echo that sentiment, because like I said, I, I only moved to the UK last year, um, 2019, and Shaka probably can tell us how he felt uh, living in the UK for so long as he did. And I remember just walking into the press box covering cricket for the 2019 Cricket World Cup. And, and I literally stood out as the only um, black woman there too, except for when I would see you there. And there is, cricket at least has this, sort of aura about it here that even mm. when you walk into Lords, I remember thinking to myself, do I belong here? Like I literally felt, yeah. I was like, am I good enough to be here? Cause I did not fit. 
how everyone was dressing or how everyone was telling you you dress. And it's like you said, they don't say it outright anymore, but you can tell from certain looks and certain glances that you almost get that feeling right. I, I still feel like in 2020, I'm questioning if I really belong here or my people belong here. And Shaka, I don't know if you've ever, you know, had that feeling, at least with football, that Ebony probably would have had in cricket as well. Well, I, I haven't had that issue in, in, in football per se. Um, I'm, I'm painfully aware of it, uh, especially given my, the role that my father played in, in my own life. Um, and in, just in, in terms of, of race relations kind of coming through. And just to give you the short version of, of the story, Ebony, my, my dad was wrongfully arrested by, by the police in the early 60s. Um, yeah. He sued the Metropolitan Police and won what was then a Brit British record settlement. He used mm -hmm. that money to enroll in law school, go back to Trinidad, where wow. he met and proposed to my mother. So I, I've always had that story as part, of, as part of my own background, as part of my own backdrop. And admittedly, I've never had a lot of in-depth discussions with my father around it because he took on a little bit of a, a um, celebrity status, certainly within the Black community as a result. And I would see how it would affect him in having to tell that story, even mm. to friends, people who maybe were in Trinidad and weren't in England uh, at the time. And I, I, I saw the emotional toll it took on my dad, even telling that story mm. to his brothers or sisters or his closest friends. So I've, I've, I kind of picked up the, the gist and, and the bits of the story along the way. So I've always been aware of that and which is, has kind of driven my own uh, responsibilities to my community as, as a footballer. I, I also feel that sport affords you, um, affords you an education that you can't get otherwise in that, and I'll use Newcastle, I always use Newcastle as my example, where else can I sit in a room that's 20 by 20, let's say, and be five feet away from somebody from Colombia, five feet from somebody from Belgium, somebody from London, somebody from the northeast of, of England. And we all share in, in those experiences. And, and that for me, um, that, that, that speaks to my own experiences. But I'm, I'm keen to hear from you, Ebony. I know mm. you, you talk about cricket's history, uh, about its legacy. Now here you are as, as a black woman coming into this legacy. Um, blazing a path in that, listen, I accept black men were part of, of, of cricket uh, from the time, um, as, as you put it, the English decided to, to export it to, to its colonies. Mm. But this is new territory for you. This is new territory for, for a black woman to be involved in this sport. Mm. How did you manage that? And how does that now contrast to the role you now play as as an analyst, because I'm, mm. and again, you're just using my own experiences. It's so different being a player, and then mm. being uh, and then retiring, and now you have a, I, I believe a, 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 a different type of responsibility. Is mm. that how you see it? And and how how do you contrast it to? Yeah, I have to be honest with you. Uh, my natural personality, or well, Alexis will know this because we're good friends. Um, my natural personality is wanting to be easygoing, not ro rock any boats, not mm. upset anyone. Um, and as a player, I did that very well. I think I, uh, I cruised under the kind of radar of just being friendly and happy-go-lucky. Um, I think when I moved from playing, and play, as a player, you will know you're so single-minded, all you're caring about is trying to get your next cap or help your team win, and it's sim simple. And then when I moved into commentary, I suppose that's the first time you kind of start to look at the world and your environment a little bit more. You're going around analysing the game in a deeper way, and those questions that you may be buried down as a player start to really probe at you. And you're asking, why are we not seeing you know, more diversity? Why every time, like you said, Alexis, do I go into a commentary box? Why am I not seeing more kids come through? All these sort of things start to get to a point where you look around and you go, look, I was the first black woman to play for England. There's a whole gap of black people coming through. We, we're struggling in our game here. Um, I'm, I sit on a board at Surrey, which is one of the most powerful clubs in, uh, you know, so I'm in the boardroom, one of the most powerful clubs in our country. And you think, if I maintain this easygoing personality, um, 
that's great but the only person who will benefit from that is me and do I want to step up and start to speak up and that was quite a hard decision for me because uh, that survival thing I talked about of um, mm. you know wanting to keep your job keep your your paycheck going keep smiling was there but also realizing I am now in a privileged position so we talk about privilege you know uh, there's lots of different types of privilege I, I've moved into a position of privilege I've got a cap a world cup for my country um, I've got a title as the first black woman and there are not a huge amount coming through and if you don't start to speak up and advocate um you know then i have to question myself about my values so i would say now i have got a responsibility um i don't know if i want to use the word i'll say i've got an opportunity that's a better way of putting it because i think responsibility feels too heavy but i've got an opportunity to try and help shape um you know the next direction and i'm sure we'll talk about some of it but I, you know i've realized now i can use my platform my influence connect with other people who are like-minded to try and make a difference. So yeah, it, it wasn't an easy process um, internally, like shifting from, I suppose, feeling disempowered to realizing I can be in a position of empowerment to try and make a change. And then I know one of the things that you did say, I'm um, just mentioning obviously your cat for England and your World Cup as well. Um, now, when everyone introduces you, they do tack on the fact that you still are the first black woman to play cricket for England and you did actually say that to you it, it almost made you feel a bit embarrassed back then and mm. I understand because it, it sort of puts you under this microscope like a a weird specimen like oh against all odds she was here mm. when for us it's it's almost like well why shouldn't there be more black women playing you know mm. for England has that kind of changed now how you look at it how you kind of accept that title are you more um mm proud of it I guess we, we could say do you feel like it can change you know it's really interesting because um like I hated being referred to that when I played um I remember getting an award when I was like 16 17 I was at a, England juniors were playing Australia when they were touring and I got an award which was um to commemorate one of the first British people to play back in 1900 Charles Olivier and the cringe I felt when the award was given to me, um, but I could hear my teammates sniggering um, in the background, some of them of like, you know, why is she getting that? They, they didn't get it. Uh, they didn't get the historical. And I felt embarrassed. I just didn't want to be seen for the color of my skin. Um, and so I remember taking that award thinking, oh my God, I don't want anyone to see it. But the truth is that you have to deal with and people from different backgrounds deal with this every day is that people will see the color of your skin and um you know as much as you might want to run away from labels or how people are going to see the truth is that's how i'm going to be seen so as you know I'm, it's sad that i felt that emotion for a long time of being embarrassed about it but equally now i'm like i'm using this as a leverage to inspire the next generation through some of the programs that we're doing and so I had to go from a place of not wanting to own it to I'm owning this okay I was the first how many more can we get through the door so that my legacy as a player or someone who's part of the game isn't left that she was the one and only or that you know there's another lady Sophia Dunkley and we've had a few players but you're like I don't want that to be the end of the legacy so therefore maybe I can use it now because the media crack onto it people see it and say, can I use that narrative to help open the doors for others? So, um, you know, so again, it's uh, going from, you know, it's, it's sad that I felt that as a kid and a, a younger person and as a player, but now reti after retiring, I realize it's a chance to just use the best of it and, and, and make change with that label. Ebony, I really do appreciate your, your honesty in, in addressing this. And, if I can add anything to that, is, is please don't be embarrassed about how you felt even back then. Listen, as, <laughs> as, as, a, as a former sportsman myself, you, you only want to be acknowledged for your sport. And mm. I think that's the, the embarrassment isn't the, isn't the right term. But I, I, um, but, I, but I do understand exactly what you were going through then, because I, I think we all do it at, at those younger ages. We're, that, that you want to be seen as, as a cricketer or as a footballer, mm. not necessarily the first. I think it's later in life when mm. you start to notice the room and, um, and, and how unique you are in occupying some of those spaces. 
how, how many recognize that representation matters? That mm -hmm. for us to see the next black girl coming through for England, um, they, they look to you and, and will recognize the, the role that you've played. And so I, I, I understand, but, but I thank you very much for, for your efforts and, and your resilience through it all. And, and, and I know I'm going to pick you up on something that you said previously, and, and you, you spoke about the direction of, of sport and, and race relations within that sport. Now, mm -hmm. within the football fraternity, there, there's a lot of discussion around taking the knee before games and why do we still do it? Should we still do it? And opinions are torn, regardless of, mm -hmm. of, of who you speak with. Because many feel it's token, and on the one hand, I agree, but then people like me say we also have to have that because we need to have those conversations around dinner tables or on the bus mm -hmm. or the train station when, or the train when, when you're going to work. Where do you fall in terms of that discussion and how do we move our sporting systems forward to be more, to be truly more inclusive? Yeah, I've got um, two parts to answer to that. So taking a knee, um, I've sort of said more recently that I, I'm taking cricket specifically because I think every sport has got to really evaluate its, its, its uh, background, its roots, and it might have a different answer. Cricket in England, for example, England took it for three games um, against the West Indies and then it was dropped. And for me, when we look at our sport here, we're one of the least diverse sports going in our country. Um, and I felt that, especially when a time where players had spoken about the challenges they'd had uh, gone through, uh, the system, the problems within it, that taking it for a couple of games isn't going to shift the consciousness of the public who watch the game. Um, they will see it. Oh, maybe that's nice or that's interesting or something and completely forget about it. And I thought it was a chance for a sport that is so steeped here in the UK, anywhere in England, in the history of the empire and the impact that that's had on the world and the, you know, systems of slavery and all of that. There's a chance to, if we did it for a summer, so I'm not saying do it forever. I think, you know, at some point you've got to put some sort of curb on it. But I felt summer was a statement. A summer said, mm. do you remember, you look back in the history book and people talk about that summer that say English crickets took a stand. And I felt that would have been a really powerful statement. It would have been um, on the consciousness of the public. Sky, who I worked for, had it for the whole summer that we worked and we were allowed to wear our badges. And to me, that was a statement. It, it says that this is not a passing thing. This is something important. The other side of it, you know, some people talked about an educate. I think education is important and I don't mind that either. So if you don't take a need, but you're engaged in education, then what is the education program? So I felt from a cricket perspective here, we should have done more. Um, we should have made a line in the sand where it was a time to say prior to this, we've had our challenges as a sport, but from now we're going to come in solidarity. We're going to educate our fans, our players, our community and make a difference. Um, in terms of the overall game, I think there's three, or sports in general, there's three P's that I look at that I think um, we should just evaluate. Participation, performance and power. So participation is the grassroots. And I, I feel that it's not just about the black community. Your sport should represent your community. So, you know, I'm based at Surrey. We should look at our community as a whole and see if our sport represents it. At Surrey, I'm from Brixton area, um, nearly 50%, so 42% of young people are from a black community, but none are coming through. And so for me, we are not representing our community if what's walking around our gates is not coming into the gates. Um, mm. So Durham, for example, might have more white working class. I wouldn't expect them to have a huge amount of black people, but what you want is your grassroots to represent your community. Then when it gets to performance, that should translate because you're seeing those people come through and you need high quality coaches, high quality directors of sport, all those sort of S and C that represent your community. But I think without the challenge we have, which is the biggest issue in a lot of sports is unless you have people in positions of power, there's no one keeping that triangle accountable. And that's what we've seen. You know, there are no black people, for example, in England in, in, on the board um, at each, that national level. And so then there's been no one asking questions about what's happening at performance and participation levels. So I think those three Ps have to be in balance for me. And the number one place I think it starts is with getting people in positions of power 
to look through the whole system and make sure that it's representative of different communities. And, and unless that happens, I think we're going to go in circles in some of the sporting worlds. And that's what we're seeing is you might see more athletes who might make it through in certain sports, but things don't change because there are no one from the top really asking the hard questions. And I mean, uh, in terms of representation, because that's what we do talk about and just having representation at the, at the highest level we see. Uh, most recently, you and I talk about it um, in Formula One with Lewis Hamilton, how he kept saying that now that he's reached here, it's huge for him because growing up, he never had anybody. And there's still nobody that's black like him that he can even look across mm -hmm. his shoulder to and share this experience with. Um, and there was an article that came out in the UK just recently about um, two umpires also uh, expressing that, that even in umpiring that came out, and I'll read the stat to you, Ebs, that really took me again by surprise that we could say this in 2020, that the last black, Asian and minority ethnic umpire to be added to the ECB's first class list was 28 years ago, when I was two years old. And how is it that, this is also umpiring, how is it that in, in you know, a country now as diverse as England or, or for us looking at cricket at feeling like it should be a diverse country, a diverse sport here, does that start surprise you? And if so, I know that this, during this entire time, we've constantly been talking and you've, I would like to say, admired what the sports organizations in the United States have done following the death of George Floyd, seeing the NBA players walk off, seeing NFL players, you know, threatening um, whether boycotts or whatnot as well. And you've almost had to look at cricket and wonder what can be done here to, to if it gets to that level where you have to fight fire with fire. Um, is When you read a stat like that, what do you think more cricket has to do? And have you already heard whispers or talks of it going in the right direction? Yeah, so um, a few things. One, that's that just you hear it and you think, I mean, that's, just, that's, that's ridiculous, isn't it? That's generations of, that's generations. Um, and the honest truth is the current systems are not working for everybody. They're working for certain communities, um, which is what we see represented in our game at all levels in cricket here at the moment. But the systems aren't working for wider communities. I've had some good conversations with people in positions of power in our game. And I think the willingness is there in terms of this summer has opened up um, scrutiny accountability and I, I feel that people want to make change um, I am impatient though and I have said this recently that I want to see it quicker I want to hear what the plans are I want to know what they are I want to see it rolling out and I'm saying that based on someone who's doing work with an ACE program where we just got half a million from the government to invest so this is not me sort of throwing fingers and not doing anything myself it's just saying that I appreciate that these things take time to make changes on big systems. Um, but when you start, when you hear all these stories, and I'm sure there'll be more that comes out and more statistics that just keep flowing, you know, it makes you think, okay, come on guys, please, um, let's, um, let's get things moving. So I know that the willingness is there and, and more so, I, th I think actually in the past, I've heard conversations which you knew there wouldn't be any follow-up and there wouldn't be any action. I have seen that there is a desire and a willingness. Um, my only um, ask, or not ask, because I'm not, no one's listening as such, but my only wish or desire is that it happens quickly because I don't want another 10 years to go and, you know, we miss a generation of player or umpire or scorer or, you know, someone who could have been a valuable contributor to our sport. Um, that while these things are being put in place, it just gets missed. So I want to see urgent action because I think those stats, what you just read out, signals urgent action needed to me. That's what I hear is a sense of urgency. Um, and I just hope that uh, the willingness also translates into urgency. Exactly. I mean, that, that stat is, like I said, I don't feel like a spring chicken. I know I'm not that old, but to know that I was two years old the last time. You're getting on, Alexis. I'm, don't I'm, getting, on. <laughs> I'm getting on. I'm getting on. So, that, is a, that is a really, um, I suppose, scary stat. And then just continuing with these kind of things. And um, I don't want to really call it a rebellion, but it, it almost has to be, you know, it almost really has to be. Um, you see certain athletes, I suppose, at least here, um, 
Marcus Rashford being one, mm. exactly what he does. But you see global, they've become sorts of global icons now. Colin Kaepernick, who started it, you know, in the mm. States. We've seen how LeBron James and even someone like yourself that said, you don't usually curse in your Instagram posts. But sometimes mm. when you see these mm. atrocities going on, you know, we lose ourselves because mm. you almost have to get that sick and fed up to speak out the way in which a lot of these athletes do. Do you feel like cricket is still lacking that, that Marcus Rashford, that Raheem Sterling, that LeBron James to really go out into the forefront and tackle it alongside, say, yourself? Do you know what I think possibly um, makes a difference to feeling the need to, to, to speak out is just pure experience. You know, Mark Rashford, for example, talking about child poverty here, which is something that he's done, is because he knows what it feels like. And I, you know, I grew up on free school meals and um, single parent mummy worked through the nights. And I think without, this is why representation is important in sport, because without people from different communities who experience things like racism, sexism, um, you know, poverty, lack of social mobility, um, then when these big issues happen, it might not resonate for a lot of athletes. And there's no better inspiration at the moment. I can't, I'm like, I posted on my Instagram yesterday um, a picture of athletes who are, you know, Naomi Osaka. I mean, how young is she? And she's going out to perform with face masks with the names of, you know, people who've had horrible atrocities, but as a beacon of, we need to do something about this. And I, you know, I realized for me how hard it was to speak about. So I don't think I could have done much as much as a player um, because of the fear of how it would affect your career. So to, and so it's been easier now I've retired to see these guys do this in the heat of their career. I mean, Marcus Rashford is what, early twenties and to be standing up for things they believe in whilst, you know, Lewis Hamilton, um, seventh world uh, title and, at the same time, Black Lives Matter, sustainability. It's ridiculously inspiring and empowering to do that during your career. So I feel we've got a new generation of athletes now who have come from different backgrounds and different experiences that it's so important to them now that there's, you know, there's, there's no way around it. And I feel like if we had, if you go back to the Black Panther movement and, you know, we knew what it was like back in the 60s, you know, that was an urgency that athletes felt they had to demonstrate for then. And I think athletes are feeling that now that, you know, we want to keep moving the dial forward um, and you've got to stand up and speak. And so to see it is so powerful, inspiring. Um, and also I, I really res respect and applaud that they're not waiting for the authorities and the powers that be to, to make these changes they're doing it themselves you know I'll throw in someone like Mag Megan Rapino, who you know even in some ways she's more powerful because she's spoken about race um where you know she's talking about coming from a white background and also realizing how important it is to stick with your your fellow friends brothers sisters etc and so that's just as powerful to me to see athletes standing up so it's a different it's a different generation and um I really hope that it inspires long-term action. Um, it already has. It's already broken open the doors and the conversations, but it's, it's a powerful to see. It's really powerful to see. I know, I was going to say, because you, um, in terms of this new breed of athletes, I suppose, or this new generation that really has become more vocal, um, you've also come up with the ACE program to tell us a bit uh, more about that, because it truly, I feel like it's definitely what, even though it's a small branch of cricket here in the United States, in the UK rather, and not say worldwide yet, but it is something mm. that the sport really needed, don't you think? Yeah, massively. Um, just to give you a summary, um, well, here in the UK, decline of black players, 75%. Participation is less than 1%. You know, it's really low considering what it should be. And um, I spoke with our chief exec at Surrey, um, and we were just like, there's an urgency here. These numbers are horrendous. Like, that's how I felt. The numbers are horrendous. Um, and so the first thing we had to do, we, we just went out and said, we're looking for talent. Anyone from an African or Caribbean heritage background, get in touch and come to an open trial. And when we said that, we didn't expect, because there weren't any in our traditional clubs or traditional environment, we weren't expecting to find much talent. And the thing that blew us away was the amount of talent that walked through the doors. Um, we found some players that have real potential to kick on and play county cricket, many that should be in clubs or junior, you know, performance structures. And that blew my mind in so many ways because one, here in England, we, we push this myth that the black community aren't interested in cricket, they've gone to football, they don't care. 
And actually the flip was what we found is they do care. What most were saying is that they felt excluded from our game. And that, that changed that what's been powerful about AIDS is it's changed the narrative because no longer can we sit there and say the black community don't care. What we're realizing is the truth is we've closed the doors on some of these communities. Um, and actually there's a big source of talent that wants to be part of the sport. Um, so we got going, we've got, you know, one of our players straight away um, had been involved before, before, but ended up playing for the under 18 team and, you know, hopefully fingers crossed, let's see how their career progresses. But Sport England, who was our like, government funding for sport, got in touch and has funded us over half a million to, to get out deep into the community and build a pathway. We're starting in London and Birmingham with ambitions to be in five cities. So, you know, all of a sudden we've gone from zero to a hundred, we're hiring staff, we're getting performance teams, we're getting out, you know, I'm, uh, we're gonna be profiling like council estates. Like you think of some of the, the hardest reach areas, like we're going in there and we're like, right, where's, where's the talent? Who wants to play? Um, even if you don't make it, we're creating structures that you can be part of the game and feel welcome. So, um, that sense of urgency for me and the team that are working on it is really high. We don't want to wait for others to necessarily get on board and move. We're moving with people who are ready to move. And what we've seen in such a short time is there's a community that are ready, that are willing, that have talent, have an interest. The, the, the family members who are coming out saying, I still love this game. Well, why are you not coming to the stadiums? You know, let's get them through the doors. So it's opened up a whole realm of opportunity. And I think that, what that says to me is that model of ACE, whether it's for the black community, it could be for white working class, it could be for um, South Asian heritage, it could be for all sorts. Should, there should be tailored targeted programs looking at communities who are excluded, you know, from different sport. I look at Australia, for example, and I've looked at a bit of their history around the Aboriginal community and the stolen generation. I would love to see that Australian team reflective of some of those communities and that come through. And so I feel there's an ACE model that could be used around the world to attract different communities that are not being supported into and through sports. Uh, it might look different, the needs would be different, but the, the values have got to be the same, is seeing value in having um, diverse communities supported in different sports. Exactly, hopefully one day we'll get Shaq out there to play some cricket too. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to see me play cricket, Emily, I'm telling you. <laughs> I think <laughs> you tried. You tried. Uh, yeah, I, I gave it a go. <laughs> At least you can run between the wickets, but don't try and hit the ball. But <laughs> <laughs> well, it was absolute pleasure talking to you. I mean, I hope that now we're moving on the conversation to like what we can do next. And like you said, because a lot of us feel this impatience that we've been talking about what you could possibly do next. It's time to actually just see it. Time to just move mm. on and see it. So hopefully, we do get there soon. Everybody, thanks for having thanks me, guys. Thanks for your time and good luck with your endeavors. Thank you so much. Thanks, Shaka. Cheers.